Good evening. Hello, everyone, one and all. I hope you're all well. It is the 28th of January. We have clawed our way through January 2021. For those of you doing dry January, uh, I, I'm only drinking at weekends. That, for me, is a drastic improvement. But I know it's taken it's, it's taken its toll. It feels like the longest January we've ever gone through in this seemingly never-ending nightmare. Now, today, we've got a really, really important show. Let me just set the scene. Imagine Jeremy Corbyn. Don't park what you think about Jeremy Corbyn, by the way. It's not actually relevant for this thought exercise. But imagine Jeremy Corbyn had been prime minister. Imagine he had presided over one of the worst death tolls on the face of the earth. The worst death toll, uh, the worst death rate, sorry, apart from Belgium and Slovenia, whose populations are far smaller than ours and therefore make no basis for comparison a death rate significantly worse than that bequeathed by Donald Trump's United States of America, repeated lockdowns imposed too late, the catastrophic economic consequences, one of the worst in the world. Just imagine. Now, I don't think actually it's hyperbolic to say that if Jeremy Corbyn had been prime minister under this calamitous mess, which genuinely could not have gone much worse, quite literally, because... There is almost no other country on earth where this has gone worse. I think there would have been talk of a military coup a very long time ago. How did the, how did the British government get away with one of the worst disasters in British peacetime history, one of the worst disasters in this pandemic on the face of the earth? Now, this was always going to be hard. It was a pandemic. Obviously, there's a limit to how much you can be prepared, although... There were preparations in place which were sucked into uh, preparing for no-deal Brexit. But that's not strictly relevant for what we're talking about today. If we look at the polling, the Tories are still ahead in some polls. In the polling average, slightly ahead. It's neck and neck. In terms of who people blame, more people than not blame the public by a large margin for the surge in infections than their own government. Boris Johnson is not someone who people are demanding resign, despite the fact that one in about six, every 600 people has died in this country during the course of this pandemic. How is this possible? What we're talking about today is the role of the British media. Now, we often talk in, uh, in, very, in very somber terms. It's often the free press, the free press, you know? Now, what do we mean by the free press? Now, the government do not control the press or the media. They don't, not true. We're not North Korea, not the most ambitious place to start, I have to say. But we live in a country where most newspapers are run by oligarchs who, for their very rational economic interests, support a conservative party which defends the status quo from which they profit and benefit from. Uh, where journalists are drawn from a very similar background in an industry afflicted by groupthink, and a broadcast media which all too often echoes the priorities of the British press and a BBC whose own independence is compromised. We'll talk about all of these things because I've got two great guests who I'm about to introduce uh, to you who can speak in far more informed terms than myself. Now, a bit of housekeeping before I bring them in. A lot of you aren't watching this on YouTube. In fact, most of you, please come into YouTube. It helps the show just by you clipping or clicking on the YouTube link. So please do that. When you're into YouTube, press the subscribe button. It's just below take you seconds or less, and then press the notifications bell. That way you'll get notifications uh, whenever we do these videos. And um, for those of us who are supporting this channel, as we do lots of interviews and documentaries and these live shows, uh, thank you so much for your support on Patreon slash Owen Jones 84. Uh, if you want to support us £3 a month or anything you want to spare, you can do that and we hugely appreciate it and you help us decide all the things that we're doing. Uh, if you want to help the show in another way, you can use Super Chat to pose questions to our esteemed and informed guests uh, using the dollar sign below, whatever you want to give, and uh, I'll put those questions uh, to our incredible guests. Now, I'm going to bring them both in. Please come in. Uh, this is to, prof to two professors, no less, Professor Natalie Fen uh, Fenton and Des Friedman. Thank you so, so much, both of you, for, for joining us today. Welcome. Good to meet you. Know. Two national media out um, uh, experts. Now, as you can all see, we've we have a very strict dress code <laughs> on this panel. Uh, I just noticed if it looks like we're all linked together. By yeah, it does, sadly. 
this this was entirely intentional, as you can <laughs> see. Um, before, right, so now, I, I, just, just so everyone knows, both Goldsmith, two, two of the leading media experts in this country, uh, and, and we're going to draw on your expertise. Now, what I want to do to set the scene is I'm going to give you some, I want to, we're going to keep you here because I want to see your responses. I want to see your responses to this. I want to see the responses of other people. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of some egregious examples, and there are far more, far more. But I'm going to start. Let's start with Robert Peston at ITV. Now, this is March the 8th, 2020. Response from senior government sources, the Italians did several of the populist non-science-based measures that aren't any use, there who not to follow. That, of course, is when northern Italy was being consumed with death, the first major outbreak in Europe, the hospitals overwhelmed. We had time. We had time in this country. That time was fitted away, and a national broadcast journalist was simply relaying uh, government ministers tapping into xenophobic caricatures of Italians. Let's talk, look at another Robert Peston piece. This is in The Spectator. Herd immunity will be vital to stopping coronavirus. This is The Spectator on the 12th of March, 2020, when the British media was pushing, uh, uh, the British government was pushing herd immunity. They pretend they weren't afterwards. They absolutely were. They pushed it to their favourite journalists, including Robert Peston. Let's have a look at this headline. This is quite the corker. Those questioning the government's coronavirus strategy are not only wrong, they're a danger to the rest of us. That's Bobby <laughs> Friedman in The Telegraph. Those questioning the government's strategy on coronavirus, 13th of March, are dangerous. Can so I they're, they're the ones it? threatening the public. Let's look at Laura Cunnersberg, the BBC's political editor, shall we? She tweeted a lot of chat today about the approach the government is taking over when to push the button and more drastic actions to confront coronavirus. Of course, there is controversy, but there is a very punter-friendly explanation of what their scientists are trying to do worth a watch. Now, I looked at this video, and everyone, you should look up this video. It's a, just a random podiatrist that's a foot expert. Uh, I think he's called Footman471. Um, and he tries to explain herd immunity in everyday kind of language by... Put, you put, uh, he's got a bucket of water and he pours it in and tries to explain it. a load of pseudo-scientific gibberish. Platformed by the BBC, that video went viral. Millions of people watched uh, the video of a random podiatrist. Uh, I don't know who fed that to Laura Connersberg. I doubt she was just searching on YouTube and found a random podiatrist with a thousand followers on YouTube. Who knows? Uh, Laura Connersberg, another fascinating example. This is when uh, the Pippa Crow at the Mirror broke the story that Dominic Cummings uh, broke the government's own coronavirus lockdown rules. You all know the story, testing his eyesight by driving to Barnard Castle, etc. Now, Laura Connersberg replied to this tweet, <laughs> replied to Pippa saying she did government rebuttal for them. Source says his trip was within guidelines as Cummings went to stay with his parents so they could help with childcare while he and his wife were ill. They insist no breach of lockdown. Literally, that's, I mean, come on. That's rebuttal by the government. Under Number six, this has uh, become very notorious, to be fair. This is two journalists. Hipster analysis, bring it up. Uh, this is when Labour demanded the government publish their scientific advice, presumably so more people with humanities degrees can form expert opinions in epidemiology, etc. And Aisha Hazaraki at the Evening Standard, yep, I really need some hipster analysis to reassure me. It goes on. Here we go. Rental, John Rental at the Independent, who says, I hope we don't have an inquiry when this is over. If there are lessons to be learned, fine. But if there's just blame to be spread, forget it. Uh, eat out to help out. This was, uh, which caused up to a fifth. Uh, of cluster of COVID cluster uh, clusters over the summer. Grab a ten pound rishi dishy, lovely stuff. Doctor Feelgood, as he was also portrayed to the rescue. Doctor Feelgood, North Korea would be embarrassed. Their official outlets by that. Uh, the BBC. Oh, you think North Korea is embarrassed by that? Let's have a look at the BBC, shall we? The BBC portrayed Rishi Sunak as Superman. Literally, his video as Superman. They did, and let's have. Uh, let's. Yeah, I mean, they deleted. They deleted this yeah. afterwards. They said it was removed for editorial <laughs> reasons. Because people were going, what on earth are you doing? You're yeah. the BBC. You're not supposed to portray members of the British government as superhero. And finally, just finally, the Daily Telegraph, go back to work or risk losing your job. And this was at the end of August when the government were reopening the economy without a functioning test and trace system, which they'd handed to corporate uh, clients of theirs. Uh, they had time in August. They could have suppressed, brought the virus down to a controllable degree if they had a test and trace system in place that was functioning. 
and we would not be in this mess today. But people were driven back to work under the threat of the sack with the British media used to bully them. What do we learn from some? And by the way, just quickly, we'll come on to number after this. I'm going to point out very important for balance reasons. This is not all the British media have done. There have been excellent cases of journalism by the Sunday Times. We all remember Emily Maitlis's introduction uh, to Newsnight about Dominic Cummings. Uh, my own colleagues at The Guardian, there's been some brilliant journalism done, but I'll come on to that. I don't want to talk about that bit yet. We are going to talk about that because it's important we look at the whole round. What do we learn? Uh, what do we learn from this? Who wants to kick off? You, you know, I mean, I'm really happy to start. Every time you see those headlines, it's shocking again. Because if we do live in a society where, you know, our national news system is supposed to interrogate those with power, and those with power in the pandemic literally means lives, you know, saved or lost. And if they can't do that in this situation, if they are just going to parrot a government propaganda, really, a government line, then actually we've got some really um, serious problems uh, across the board with the media. And we have to think very carefully about what that means, because this is not, you know, this is not, it's, it is kind of in, it, like saying we just support a government war. It's like, you know, these are huge numbers, hundreds of, you know, 100,000 lives lost. And we've got a media who turns around and says, but Boris Johnson's very sorry, so it's okay. You know, that, I mean, it, it is just um, beyond belief, really. And um, I, I think what's going to happen as a consequence of that is a lot of people are losing trust and faith in what the media are telling them. We know that the, um, so we know from research that coverage of the pandemic has focused not on government policy, largely, it's focused in other places. We know that as that coverage has continued, trust in news coverage has decreased. As just as trust in politicians have decreased. So it's not doing them any favours. And, you know, I, you know, what we're seeing is a, a news media largely being shown for being actually kind of operating with government rather than interrogating them. Des, I mean, what, go on, Des, go for it. Well, I'm saying, what I take from those headlines, I mean, in one way, we laugh at the horror of them, but I just think we need to be outraged. And we should remember that outrage. And I'm just as outraged. In a way, I'm more outraged today by the headlines today, because yesterday there was the coverage of 100,000 deaths. And would you believe it? Some questions were asked about how did we get to this? What, there were questions asked about the government. How do we get to this? Yeah, it's true that the headlines actually showed this poor Boris Johnson head in his hand. But you know what absolutely outrages me is that today it's as if that's been forgotten. Today the headlines now about petty squabbling between two powers, the UK and the EU, about who should get the vaccine. You know, no, no discussion about the rest of the world, no <laughs> ethical concerns, but also not even learning the lessons of yesterday. It's as if we're just moving on. Because yesterday, as they do every now and again, they remember most of the British media remember to be a little bit um, pissed off about this and maybe ask a question. But their default position is move on very quickly, um, back to that, that role of stenography that Natalie was just talking about, and then where they can, there will be new headlines about the royal family, about being in this together, um, uh, war with the EU, more military headlines. And the one thing they will not do systematically is to hold the government to account over the fact that there have been 100,000 lives lost. And the one thing they absolutely won't do, and I'm sure we'll get onto this, is to examine their own role in this. I mean, that literally has not been raised. In fact, let's just, you've brought them up. So let's have a look at some of these front pages on the horrific news of over 100,000 deaths. And I should say excess deaths are well over 110,000 yeah. now, yeah. which is the measure Boris Johnson and scientists said from the beginning we should use. So, for example, the Daily Mail, their footage, I am deeply sorry, Boris Johnson looking very, very sad. Very, very sad. Front page of the Metro. Uh, again, Boris Johnson, his eyes closed with sheer grief. I'm deeply sorry for every life lost. Front page of the Sun newspaper. Uh, Boris Johnson has had his, his face bowed. We will remember them. Front page of the Telegraph. Front page. Again, Boris Johnson, same photo of his head bowed. I'm deeply sorry for every life that has been lost. 
centering there, the, the you know, there you can almost see the way with his head bowed visually, it's as though the, the weight of the world is on Boris Johnson's shoulders. It's not pictures of you wouldn't be able to put 100,000 deaths on the front page of any newspaper in this country. Uh, but no, it's not the faces of those who've died. It's 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 putting almost the victimhood and the sorrow of the prime minister front and center rather than asking how on earth have we ended up with one of the worst death tolls on the face of the earth? Well, that image you see is the image you see every November at the Cenotaph or, you know, yeah. that that's what you see. It's, you know, remembering world, the deaths in World War One, which, of course, you know, contemporary politicians are not going to be blamed for. It's like someone else was to do with that. That's the image. The difference is now is that Boris Johnson is absolutely responsible. He is at the pinnacle of power and he is answerable to this. And those images, you know, it's like, well, are we supposed to feel sympathetic? Unbelievable. I mean, Natalie, I mean, you know, what we could say, though, is there have been on both. This is both of you. I mean, look, a lot of people watching this go, oh, you're just you're just cherry picking here because obviously the media, there are examples of them doing the job. Now, one is the Sunday Times and the Sunday Times have actually done some brilliant. Their insight team have done brilliant investigative journalism, which I cite all the time. I did a big video about the government's catastrophic handling of the pandemic and I used you know, showed the Sunday Times's own reporting in, in that piece. They did, you know, the best investigative reporting. So how does that fit in? Because I'm, you know, some will say, well, you know, some media, you know, some of the media might be doing this, but actually, you know, there are examples of the media holding the government's feet to the fire. You know, I, I do find it quite astonishing that people are prepared to say everything's fine because we've got a handful of instances where they are actually doing their job properly. And for the vast majority of the time, that's not the case. So yeah, great. It's wonderful when they do that. You cheer from the sidelines, but why are we cheering? Shouldn't this just be accepted as the norm? That actually when you've got, this is a deeply political pandemic. And I think what really um, kind of upsets me is that what journalists have done is they've tried to remove the politics. Mm -hmm. This is about a health pandemic. It's got nothing to do with decisions made, resource distribution, contracts given to private companies. You know, that's this is a health pandemic and we have to follow the science and that's all there is to it. Actually, if you don't interrogate each and every one of those decisions, you're doing the general public a disservice and you're not holding power to account you're not doing the job of a journalist. Otherwise, you are simply doing the job of a stenographer, as Des said, you know, so it's, you know, one or two examples, brilliant, bring it on, but that should be the norm, not the exception. Absolutely, I mean, I love, the fact is the Emily Maitlis um, introduction to Newsnight back in, back in April, I thought that was very powerful. I mean, you know, you kind of, almost common sense. Um, the Sunday Times piece back in March, I think a lot of people drew on it. What I love is the fact that we're expected to be grateful when the media do their job like that. Of course, you know, Channel 4 News does um, quite regular uh, detailed investigations. But should we fall over with gratitude for the few times when the media really does interrogate power or ask the more political questions that they're very uncomfortable with? And I think what we really need to ask is why does it not happen? more regularly. And it's not just a few bad apples. There are certainly some bad apples there. But we really do need to address the, you know, the structural constraints on why we have a media system, not, not just kind of haphazard media outlets, why we have a media system that is not able to hold power to account in the way that we need it more, you know, more important than ever during a pandemic. I've got some good questions on Super Chat, which I promise I'll come through, come to, so keep them coming. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, Give another example. In fact, let's give this example because I said that the polling does show. Polling is very clear. More people than not, by significant margin, blame the public for the surge in infections rather than the government. There's a big age divide there. Older voters overwhelmingly yeah. blame the public. Younger people tend to blame the government. Uh, and also there's a partisan divide, which I'm sure everyone can guess. Um but let's, I mean, here's an example of just a, a front page um, which looks at, you know, it says on the Daily Express, Patel warns selfish rule breakers. It shows um, a crowded beach. And this is from last April, so not that long into the, well, I mean, it felt like a long time at the time. It was about a month into lockdown. 
Um, and, and it was quite interesting because actually, as people pointed out, you, you kept seeing these pictures of um, of of, uh, of what seemed like crowded parks and beaches, but actually people looked into it and they found that people were using the way the lenses were used. It actually made people look crammed together. And actually, if you go to those parks, you can see most of the time people are socially distancing. Um, but I mean, what do you think? I mean, that attempt to blame, to shift, to focus on individual responsibility rather than the government it has resonated with a lot of people people in their heads a lot of them are going it's those people they don't think themselves because if you ask the other polling shows do you think you've kept by the rules over like 90 percent of people said yes absolutely completely religiously so people aren't blaming themselves they're blaming this other that they don't like i and think you have done that but i do think it's very important this is a contradictory situation the public is also blaming the government so I think there's, you know, that one of the themes you see with the media in terms of any big crisis is scapegoating. And I think there's two very big groups that have been scapegoated. I mean, probably many, um, but the public as one group, but also teachers. I hope you have time to talk about how teachers have been scapegoated by some of our biggest media outlets since since last May. And it continues to be across the BBC whole program on the world at one just the other day about how can we get people back into schools now? and You know, these pesky teachers. But the fact is, at the same time as people, um, uh, as you're saying, blaming other people, they are also, uh, you know, 60 percent, the regular polls blame the government. Actually, uh, the Reuters Institute, the study of news, had a figure of some 35 percent, more than a third of the population actually do blame the news media for making things worse. So people are holding all sorts mm. of different ideas and they're thrashing around in their head. I don't think they are letting the government off the hook. What I wish is that we were in a stronger position, and I think we should also have a discussion about um, about Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, of why Labour aren't in the lead, why there isn't a decisive lead, um, given that we have this the horror of 100,000 deaths. Yeah, we had a great discussion about that last week, funnily enough, with Michael Walker and Paul Mason, but we should touch it. We'll touch on that. Of course we will. Um, and the second part of this discussion, I should say, for everyone watching or listening, uh, we'll be focusing on the media and we've got questions on the on the structures of the media, the systemic issues. And um, so we will, I promise everyone, take take our time to, to go into that. Um, yeah, I mean, Can I just come back yeah. on that point, yeah. Owen, quickly, just because I think there's 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 a broader issue at play here with uh, media that has um, traditionally over decades focused in on individual blame and, you know, kind of and, and we've seen that through the blaming the poor for being poor, the undeserving poor, the scroungers, the, you know, the people who shouldn't be claiming welfare, but do, you know, all that sort of thing. And I think you've got an element of that coming through here with blaming individuals. You know, when you look at the places that are busiest and the parks that are, um, you know, most densely populated, it's often in areas where people have no other outside space that they can get to or go to. And that's, you know, so what you're saying there is you're uh, casting blame on a particular element of society without without trying to understand at all what the circumstances are behind that. And I, I think that plays into a long-standing kind of right-wing trope, actually, around it, it's the individual's responsibility and this has got nothing to do with direct government decisions that literally have an impact on whether we, um, you know, whether we live or die. Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, again, a very, very apt point going back to particularly 2010 to, I'd say, 2016 on Social Security, where you'd have the Conservative government working hand in hand with the right wing press on this idea of the the the, the, the undeserving scrounger. You'd have, you know, front page, I'm exaggerating here, but people get the gist, front pages of newspapers, you know, scrounger with 50 kids in a mansion made out of widescreen television sets. And, and what they do is they urge people to extrapolate. This is the tip of the iceberg. You find the most extreme examples, and then you say, well, actually, it's far bigger than this, when actually, obviously, the statistics show benefits for it is, is completely marginal. Yeah. Uh, but it has an impact because people... It deflects from this idea of a systemic problem to, you know, and that's what the last 40 years have done, hasn't it, of, of what we would call Thatcherism. This idea, these aren't systemic problems, the problems with how society is organised and how government policy relates to that. It's to do with individual agency and responsibility. And if things go wrong, if you're poor or you're unemployed, that's because you're not showing enough grit and determination. And if a pandemic is being 
is raging. It's not because the government completely messed it up. It's because of these ne'er do wells. What role do you think you both? I mean, just before we talk about specifically the systemic issues of the media, in terms of government, I mean, how much do you think? How much space does the media provide the government? In the sense, what I mean in this pandemic of if the media had been from day one going, why on earth is Britain an outlier on this? Given look at Italy, uh, you know, and, and and all the way through going, why are we why are we locking after we locked down too soon? Oh, sorry, not too soon. After we locked down too late last time, let's not prematurely reopen. Is is cramming lots of people indoors to eat food during a pandemic necessarily the best idea in the whole world? Shouldn't shouldn't we lock down again? Test and trace isn't working. What's if they'd have done that, do you think it would have put more? I mean, would things have been different? Uh, well, oh, Nally, go on. I, you know, I, I, I think what you've seen is a, a, a kind of coverage play out, which is really been wrapped around this idea that this is a health pandemic and we are all in it together. We've all got to take responsibility and therefore we shouldn't be challenging. And, and that's a little bit of what how Starmer's positioned himself as well in the early days. It's like, let, let's, you know, people are dying here. It, it, would, it would be wrong to actually contest the government line. Let's, this is the only way forward, let's do it. Uh, if the newspapers at that point had taken a broader view, had gone, hang on a minute, are we really going to buy this line? Are we really going to you know, just repeat those government propaganda sheets? Are we really just going to reflect back what the daily press briefings are saying? Then I think you know, we could have been in a very different position because actually what you would have had is a public who was really angry about what the government were doing. And, and as you said now, you know, people are going, well, you know, people, everyone's got to take responsibility. So the idea of we're all in it together, that narrative trope has really stuck. Well, one of my favourite headlines is definitely is the males with the Queen saying we're all in this together. But my answer to you, Owen, is three words. Downing Street briefings. I mean, we just think back to last spring when, you know, you just had those... Uh, a gaggle, is that the right word, of journalists queuing up to, to be slightly more sensationalist or to be the front of the queue. And that was the kind of spectacle which was, again, just amplifying mostly government voices, you know, flanked by some scientists, but never doing the job. And had it, uh, had it seen its job as articulating public anger, I really do think we'd be in a different situation. I mean, we can't, we can't know for sure, but we can certainly point out what will happen if you're just reproducing government spin. But despite that, and here I am more optimistic than you, I think, Owen, which is I don't think the, government, uh, the, uh, the public have just fallen for it. I think there is huge anger. There may be huge confusion. There may not be political representation that's sufficient. But, you know, that people are holding these different ideas. So I am slightly more optimistic because I don't think they just buy that line. I'm not sure what line there is, but there was something to follow. And if the media were really articulating here is the opposition, then I think we'd be in a different situation. And I think there's another part to the story that we need to remember as well, is back in those early press briefing days, you know, the government were controlling very carefully who spoke and who didn't. So where they were getting challenged by journalists, they were excluded from future press briefings. So I remember, um, I think it was Jim Cusick at the Open Democracy, asking some challenging questions, and then he was, he wasn't allowed to follow up question. He was frozen out. They refused to put up ministers to talk on Radio Four Today program. You know, this was kind of Dominic Cummings trying to control and hold that narrative in a particular way, and in doing that, forcing journalists into a position of saying, "We're only going to give you information. We're only going to let you get close." to us as, as government sources, often unnamed government sources, if you um, agree that you'll repeat what we say. Mm -hmm. And so you get this, it's quite difficult then for journalists in that position to, you know, where else are they gonna get that information from? Yeah, but it's not just the government kicking them out. When Emily Maitlis said, uh, criticized Cummings for quote, in her words, breaking the rules, the BBC then found yeah. her to be guilty of um, breaking its own impartiality rules. Yeah, I mean, I should say, by the way, because it's an important point Des raises, although it is true that polling does show that a majority of the public blame the public uh, for the rise in infections. 
a, a new poll, for example, on the Twitter yesterday from YouGov. Do you think that X have or have not done everything they reasonably can to protect the public from COVID-19? You personally, that's the person answering the poll, 81% yes, 12% no. Have the government done everything they can to reasonably protect the public? Have 26% have not 66%. So clearly, lots of people clearly, despite yeah. everything, are angry at what the government have have done. But there's still, as you say, confusion confusion there. Let's go back to some first principles, because this what this is illustrative of is a systemic problem with the media. Let's talk about ownership, because I think this, you know, if we look at the British, the British press, British newspapers, overall, most British newspapers editorially support the Conservatives. And actually, if you look compared to most of the Western world, and there are striking exceptions, I'd say Greece, maybe. But in terms of how stridently and partisan right wing these newspapers are, and you can see that in elections, they just act during an election as the fist of the Conservative government or party. I mean, what, what's going to just explain a bit of ownership of how the ownership structures of newspapers work to people who don't know much about it? Who goes first, Des? You go you first, because this, this is one we talk about all the time. We spend too much time on this. Um, well, uh, there's a very simple fact that um, the last data I saw from November to, uh, tells us that three companies control 80% of national newspaper circulation. Three companies own 80% of national newspaper circulation, including Daily Mail Group uh, and, um, and Rupert Murdoch's News UK. Now, before you say, oh my God, why are you talking about newspapers, you old professors? That's just because you're interested in that stuff. Can we please remind people that they have very uh, um, uh, extensive online reach with these. So you have The Sun with something like 36 million unique monthly users. The same with the Daily Mail. I think it's exactly the same, 36 million. The, the BBC with 40 million. Um, uh, the Reach group, which has, you know, with the Mirror and then goes throughout um, uh, local and regional media as well, has something like 40 million. So these, it matters. It matters that their voices, um, and we'll talk, I'm sure, about their interconnections with uh, the powerful, they have huge reach. The internet has intensified that reach. And so what we have is a highly concentrated uh, proprietorial press system in this country, which basically, when we talk about free press, it is free to, to uh, advocate on behalf of the powerful in this country. And when it comes to elections, pretty much all the time to make sure that it is the cheerleaders for the Conservatives. Not always. And again, people say it's a free press. You know, they supported Blair. Well, ask some questions about that. Sorry, Natalie, you'll probably want to add to no, that. I that. <laughs> no, I think, you know, that, that it's that concentration has increased over years. Mm. So when we used to say, you know, five to ten years ago, it was terrible. It's getting worse. This spring, we've got um, Rupert Murdoch setting up um, News UK news channel. Um, uh, in his words, to rival the BBC, so that those people who are on the right and think that the BBC is just full of lefties will flood to him in a kind of what he's hoping is more of a Fox style approach. Of course, he'll still be bound by so-called impartiality rules on that. Maybe we can talk about that in more detail because they're clearly not fit for purpose either. But you know, so we're operating in a, a media ecology that is only defined by a tiny minority of the elite. In, in a sense, and that elite is replicated in the people who work in those organisations on the whole, and the sorts of messages they are told to put out. Now, it's not quite as simple as you will print this um, uh, and people do it, but often in newspapers now, you know, the contracts that journalists are on are very short time, they're very insecure, and if you're a journalist on an insecure contract, you're going to be compliant. So if you're told to go out and print, um, you know, stories which are based around Islamophobia, then, you know, you're less likely to say, actually, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. So you know, there, there is a whole um, news ecology that has grown up around these corporate entities, which are seeking to exploit not only their workers, but also their readers in, in, in ensuring that they don't have choice, that there is nowhere else they can go. And they dominate online as much as they dominate in you know in print and that it's worthwhile also mentioning the whole response to fake news which was supposed to be something that we saw online 
And so the tech giant's response to that was to create algorithms that prioritize legacy news media. So there was a brief moment in history when some of those independent news media with different types of voices were actually getting a little bit of airtime online. That's all gone because the new fake news algorithms prioritize legacy media and pull them to the top because they're apparently trusted and newsworthy. I mean, the BBC, let's, let's talk a bit about the, the BBC. Um, Oh, actually, before we... No, we'll talk about the BBC. Yeah, I mean, let, because obviously the claim there, I mean, some will go, well, actually, it's a den of leftiness. But also, uh, I'm interested in how the BBC reflects often the priorities set by a press, which objectively leans overwhelmingly to the right. Do you want to go for that, Des? Well, um, there's quite a lot to say about the BBC. I mean, one of the, the, the immediate uh, points of... Of people defending the BBC is it's attacked by everyone, so it must be doing its job right. Which I, I think we should absolutely uh, confront that argument because it's just simply not true. All the academic evidence, so these are extensive, qualitative and content analyses of content uh, uh, of BBC output, show that by and large, when we're talking about news, it privileges, for example, business voices over trade union voices. Um, when it's dealing with the with the economy. You just look at, and of course the BBC is a very big organisation. We're talking about BBC News here. I don't really want to talk about um, CBeebies too much now, but we're talking about the agenda setting elements of BBC. Well, I mean, uh, one of the other things you have to talk about is the people who populate the senior strata of the BBC. Um, you know, just look at the two people in charge now. We have a relatively new director general, um, Tim Davey, who you no know, just happened to be a, a, a Tory parliamentary candidate back in the 90s. And he will be joined um, uh, next month in a few days by Richard Sharp, who's the new chair of the BBC, who uh, was Rishi Sunak's boss at Goldman Sachs and is someone who has since 2001 made a contribution to the Conservatives of £400,000. Now, it do that doesn't strike me as a den of, uh, of liberals or communists. And the other thing to say is just to look at the, the kind of revolving door between the BBC uh, and and not just the BBC, but you know our leading news organisations and the Tories, and sometimes with Labour as well. So you know you just had people in recent years, people like Robbie Gibb, who was the head of operations at Westminster, became Theresa May's head of communications. More recently, Allegra Stratton, head of ITV uh, um, the, uh, News, and she became Boris Johnson's press secretary. I mean, there's loads of examples. So I don't think it. You know the problem is. The, the idea that the BBC is this neutral, intermediary, you know, aloof from the world of politics is simply not true. It is steeped in political elites from where it draws its most senior journalists and commentators. Yeah, now, do you want to comment on that? Just in terms of, you know, this idea of obviously the BBC being independent from government. Uh, I mean, being... that's precisely what I was going to say, actually, is the key issue really is independence. And it's obviously not independent when the government hold the purse strings and can say you know exactly how much its um, funding review will be at any one point and that threat hovers endlessly over the BBC and has a major impact on what they do I think and all the academic research and I know people will say all those lefty academics but actually the, this is scientific research that shows on the whole what you get in the BBC coverage of late is more of a kind of centre-right coverage than anything else and some of the um, recent analysis by Tom Mills on BBC journalists on Twitter was really interesting on this and what, what he showed was actually those BBC journalists because they are from a particular ilk a particular background because they fit a particular socio-demographic choose to follow politicians which kind of conform to their understanding of the world and you would have thought that would be absolutely the opposite you'd have thought that they would choose politicians from a whole range of stables and in fact that's that wasn't true and i thought you know i was shocked by that actually i thought that was really illuminating that what you have got is a, a kind of system that reproduces itself and is also tied to government in a, in a really unhealthy way. You simply can't have impartiality in a news organisation if you've got a government which has that degree of control over what you do. And, and if we want a genuine public service media that operates in the public interest, we have to take away 
that kind of the government interest we, you know you just can't have that it can't function in that way and the time has now come where we've got to address that i don't think we can any more pretend that things are okay in the bbc we desperately need public service broadcasting we desperately need it to be properly independent i mean des mentioned you know the the revolving door between the bbc and and the government and you know lots of examples again david cameron recruited his head of comms uh, yeah. from the BBC, uh, Boris Johnson, as Mayor of London, did as well. Yeah. Uh, and obviously George Osborne did, a BBC senior BBC producer. We could go on. I mean, there's a very... There's a big, uh, exactly, exactly. Allegra Stratton and so on is the most, as you mentioned, the most uh, striking recent example. And there's also, it's quite interesting, the so-called Westminster Village. Um, I mean, I should say that I've worked in the media for, <laughs> for a while and uh, my colleagues don't like me talking about this uh it provides it provokes a very angry response um generally speaking both publicly and privately um but the, i think it's important like the, the, how westminster village works because i mean it it's almost like it's a in normal times it, it's a social set i mean you know you get senior journalists senior government figures and officials and spin doctors that they spend a huge amount of time together they go for drinks they go for meals I and mean, there's examples of some of them being godparents to each other going on holiday with each other in whatsapp groups sharing gifts and memes and it's pretty matey and pally i mean it's partly that isn't it i mean i mean i know we're talking about these grand systemic issues but, but it's you know it's it's kind of more than just being mates i think it's a deep entanglement for political purposes on both sides, actually, of a media elite and a political elite. And it works in their favours. They go to the same parties, they attend, you know, they go out to the same functions, They're, they are, they go to each other's weddings. It's that sort of palliness. And, and what that translates into is better access, more access for those people to those government sources. And they, the government will keep that access going if they know that the newspapers will keep printing the sorts of things that they want. And it works both ways. So there is, there's kind of, you know, the fear in the political parties that actually if they don't do what the papers want, then the papers will reject them and therefore they won't get elected the next time round. And there's fear that actually, you know, they're on behalf of the um, journalists themselves, that if they don't, if they hold the government to account, then they won't be allowed access the next time. So you get this really unhealthy environment. And, you know, the, there was research recently that showed that the government, that sorry, the Murdoch stable, so Murdoch officials and Murdoch, visited government and government ministers 200 times in the period of two years. I mean, that's just astonishing. That's direct access to government in an excessive way over a period of two years. Now, that alone tells you something, is what's going on there. They're not interrogating them and holding them to account. Far from it, something else really deeply unhealthy to our democracy is going on. Can, can I broaden it just yeah. a teeny bit? Because obviously all of that I totally agree with. Murdoch doesn't need to go in the front door because he has his own back door there. But for me, and I'm not being complacent about this, but why should we be surprised about the obsession with the Westminster Village and therefore the kind of entanglements that take place? Because that is a dominant picture amongst the elite of how politics works. It is about um, 650 men and women in Parliament and the people who report on them. But for many of your viewers, actually, that isn't how politi what politics is about. For many of us, politics is about what happens in our communities, on the street, in our movements, in the mm -hmm. trade unions. And when you think about, you know, the great social um, uh, progressive um, uh, uh, triumphs that we have had, it wasn't just a handful of men and women voting on them. These were things, civil rights and beyond, that were fought for. So I think, in a way, it's about your definition of politics. Um, and there is a war going on between those people. And I think this was reflected very much, obviously, recently um, uh, inside Labour politics of how you understand where political change comes from. And if your view of politics is it's about inside the Beltway or in the Westminster Village, then this is the kind of media you probably would expect to get. It doesn't do us justice. It's not properly democratic. It's not properly accountable. Um, in terms of the backgrounds, too, of journalists, I mean, Anthony Cope, 
uh, sent in a question, which I feel very personally attacked over. I'm joking. Why is much of journalism taken from graduates in humanities, PSE, politics, sociology, and economics as a favourite? I'm a history graduate, Anthony. There is not a wide uh, range of experiences or expertise. Very important point. Like Owen said, group thing. As well as answering, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, but a, and a broader point with that, according to the government's own figures and various studies show that the media, the national media, is the second most socially exclusive yeah. profession after medicine and there's a lots of factors at play there's the decline of local newspapers which often provided a foot in the door for aspiring working class journalists or just for not privileged backgrounds who could leave school and without glorifying it make cups of tea climb the way up it was like an apprenticeship um the rise of unpaid internships where people are expected to work for nothing in london one of the most expensive cities on the face of the earth how can most people afford to do that with no promise of a job at the end of it either and equally and again not to attack people who do these degrees because none of this is about individuals it's systems postgraduate qualifications which are increasingly a must um, in journalism um, from places like City University and so on. Again, most people just can't afford the living costs or the fees associated with that. I mean, all of that has an impact. So I'm interested in what you think about humanities <laughs> degrees like me, but on also more widely how social, how that helps with group things. Because if you've got people from quite similar backgrounds, they're going to have quite s similar views, which will kind of reinforce each other based on their <laughs> shared experiences. Can I come in on this, Natalie? Put simply, we do not have a media system that sounds like most people, that talks like ordinary people, that actually comes from the same backgrounds as most people. We have lots of evidence of this. So I'd encourage Anthony to re check out the Sutton Trust Elitist Britain report from 2019. And that found that 43% of the most senior um, uh, editors and broadcasters were privately educated. Um, as opposed to 7% of the rest of the population, and 36% graduated from Oxford or Cambridge, which is uh, less than 1% of the average population. So, frankly, you know, these people, they, are, they come from different parts of, uh, of the world, and they're going to, you know, they're then locked into a system which kind of intensifies all of that. Um, the question is how we break out of that. And it's not just about, you know, we, we definitely need increased diversity but in terms of class, race, and so on. We definitely need that, but we also need to break the ideological grip um, of, of, of you know, the political consensus about uh, where, where power lies and how you make change. What do you think, Natalie? I think that's absolutely right. But I, I mean, I do think it's a really important point that local media is diminishing massively and that the, for the majority, it's London. If you want to be in national media, that is, and um, prohibitively expensive for the majority of people that will cut very many people out of the equation. And so you've got to then find ways of making that possible. And that does come down to the responsibility of those news organisations if they do want to reflect the views of the population at large and if they do want to actually, um, you know, not just produce more of the same and, and reproduce their news in their own image. So, you know, it, you know and that's, um, you know, they've got to take that seriously. They can't do plurality in news content if the workers within the news industry are very non-diverse, if it's all of the same. And it is, you know, it, that's a real problem. It's a problem not just in news and journalism, but it's more relevant in news and journalism in many ways because of the, the you know, what they're producing is actually setting the agenda for how or what everybody is thinking about. So if you've only got a very narrow mindset within that media industry itself, it's very difficult to break out of that and write differently and do it, you know, in an alternative way. Um, Roger D, who's a much-loved show regular, says, I thought it was Ofcom's job to regulate the media. How well are they doing that? <laughs> That's a great question, but is that Roger? But Roger, yeah. you should, the answer, don't listen to so-called experts like us on it. Do, what job do you think they're doing? I mean, their job is, formally speaking, to preside over the impartiality um, that they should be doing plurality reviews of the entire media to make sure we have a real diversity of voices. Do you think they're doing that? If you don't think they're doing that, they're doing a lousy job. I happen to agree with that. And I think we need regular plurality reviews, which even a Tory government was kind of pressured into some eight years ago, but they've never delivered on it. So there's no accountability even there. Ofcom is now increasingly, has an increasingly wide scope because it, it scrutinizes the BBC. 
But, you know, it was set up as a market regulator to ensure competition and choice in the market um, of, of, of broadcasting. Uh, you know, that, that's quite interesting. That's its legacy. Actually, we don't need a market broadcast. We need a, we need a regulator. Sorry, market regulator. We need a regulator that really is committed to the public interest. And that will mean asking some really tough questions about media um, structures in this country. It may mean, shock horror, breaking up some of the largest concentrations of media. Are they doing that? You know, is there, is there a government will behind it? Of course not. It's going to take public pressure from people like yourself to say we are not being adequately served. Uh, and of course, the latest rumour in the kind of media circles is that Paul Dacre is going to take over as chair of Ofcom. Now, Paul Dacre is Paul the Dacre. Daily Mail. And, um, you know, that, that would be an interesting position. So then you would have at the head of Ofcom, somebody who was responsible for some of the most vitriolic kind of, you know, um, racist coverage actually over many years within his newspaper. So, you know, that it's, um, it's not looking particularly good for Ofcom, I don't think. And I, I have a sense, there's almost a sense in which the government have put so much on them, so much responsibility on them. They've slashed their um, staffing at the same time. So they can't do their job. And I think there's a little bit of that going on as well. The other regulator is for the newspapers. And, you know, where do you go if you think the newspapers have um, peddled lies or misrepresentation? You know, it's mainstream news for the majority, not for The Guardian, but for the majority, they're signed up to IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organisation, which is largely owned by the News Media Association or run by them. So that's, you know, uh, so again, that's not independent at all either. And then if we're going back to the coverage of the pandemic, um, there were 50 stories in the last year which were direct inaccuracies and misrepresentations relating to pandemic, peddling really dangerous ideas and thoughts. And full fact, the brilliant um, organisation that's a fact checker, I found that these were you know, direct inaccuracies. None of them, there were many complaints, so none of them were upheld. So that's a regulator that's not doing its job either. That's an important point. Misinformation is not just to preserve us in dodgy social fringe social media companies. It sits also and emerges from the heart of our media environment. As the uh, families of Hillsborough could say, but also lots of people who are Muslims, refugees, trans yeah. people, lots of minorities targeted relentlessly with hateful bile and lies by the media. Before I ask my final question, Jack Marshall says, is client journalism regulated anywhere in the world? Is, is client, what's client, what's journalism. client journalism. I suppose what he's talking about there is the relation, a close relationship between government and media outlets. I'm not sure how that would be. Um, well, when we talk about client journalism, we generally talk about it being entirely unregulated. That's its problem. There is this thing, you know, and, and often people refer to forms of journalism, particularly in, you know, Latin American countries. I've experienced, I know, of it's around uh, Mexico. But, you know, that, that client journalism is exists in order to both support mega corporations that will then support, you know, in the hands of government that then support the newspapers. So that's an, an, an absolute entanglement of, of corruption. And that's when you get client journalism. So no, client journalism is largely unregulated. The problem uh, and the calls for regulation come when that's exposed and when people have had enough. And there you have had instances where that's been the case. Finally, so everyone's not depressed. Good. What do we do? What's, what, what, what are the kind of reforms and demands people should be fighting for, for a truly independent media? Well, I mean, we do two things, I think. One is we, try, we build our own media. And the other thing is we fight like hell in the, the movements as a whole because you found that, you know, any, um, the, some of the, the, the changes in the tone of the media will, will have been caused by the mass social movements that emerge as well. You know, if we're looking historically from civil rights and anti-Vietnam as well, they pose real problems for a dominant media consensus. So it is both looking for reforms within the media, and I'm sure Natalie can talk about some of the specific things that both of us involved with the Media Reform Coalition, and we should make sure that everyone who is watching and listening turns up to our Media Democracy Festival, which runs for a, month, for a week. We've got some fantastic meetings 
um, in the middle of March. Um, so it's both about um, uh, joining in and building those social movements more broadly, but also making sure that we have loyalties to an emerging, I think, fantastic, more uh, grassroots um, uh, media landscape that really is doing the job that much of the mainstream uh, is, an, is, an, is not structurally equipped to do. Well, you, and, uh, you're the chair, of course, of the Media Reform Coalition, exactly. So, so you, you, you hit, hit us with it. I think it's a three-pronged uh, attack that we've, you know, we have to do all three. We have to make sure that we've got new laws on media concentration and, and so that we stop that concentration at the top end and bring that right down. And, and that will um, decrease the level of power and dominance of some of those mega corporations. We've got to grow from the bottom. So we've got to make sure that independent media can break through that kind of oil slick of dominance at the top and, and have their voices heard and to do that we need to find ways of supporting them financially as well as as just kind of enabling them to grow and why not do things like tax the big tech giants and hand out some of that money to organizations that are committed to news in the public interest not profit news so they're not going to be eaten up by a commercial logic what their intent is it is to offer news in the public interest. And then at the other side, we need a vibrant, thriving, flourishing public service media that is um, funded, uh, you know, by the state, but is independent, entirely independent of government. And we need that also to be reformed so that it's more representative, it's more diverse, it's more democratic, and, and it actually does the job that it's supposed to do. And we need that fit for the 21st century. So it's got to function on digital platforms as well as just you know on our TV screens. And that that's a big ask in many ways. But until we have that, you know, think back to Jeremy Corbyn's claim for um, you know, what we really need is universal broadband access. And everyone was like, don't be ridiculous. And how during the pandemic, that has been so vitally clear that the root cause of so much inequality is people not having access to the internet. And that's as true in news and information as it is in anything else. So we've got to, we've got to recognize that the media is a vital ingredient of democracy and if we want a healthy functioning democracy we have to ensure our media ecology is diverse plural and independent both of you that was absolutely formidable what a tour de force we've we've covered a lot a huge amount yeah. there, a huge amount but your wisdom and insight has been hugely hugely appreciated not least by me, but everyone watching. Um, so thank you so, so much for joining us. For Absolute pleasure. Anytime. And this is about, yeah, as, we've, as, we've, as we've underlined in, the, in this pandemic, this horrific pandemic, having a genuine independent media isn't just an issue of democracy. It was actually a matter of life and death. Um, but it was a huge honour. So thank you for your work. Everyone do check out, of course, the Media Reform coalition and uh, support the work of both follow them both on social media they're both absolutely brilliant it's been a big honor and i will i will speak to you both soon take care so i've got an exciting announcement by the way they were great by the way they were absolutely fantastic as you would expect both uh two preeminent experts uh very exciting uh announcement we're finally launching as an audio podcast i know lots of people were getting annoyed about I think, obviously, our very great interviews with the range of people from Noam Chomsky to Judith Butler, Stuart Lee to Chelsea Manning, uh, Gary Young to Peter Hitchens, nothing if not eclectic. Um, but I know watching uh, those videos or listening to this show, uh, it's an ask. So you can now listen to it on your jog, while you're cooking, whatever. So we're going we're gonna to launch it tomorrow. Very exciting. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, we're going to launch it. Um, so please look out for that. It will be on iTunes. Uh, it will be on Spotify. Uh, it will be on all the other ones. iTunes, obviously iTunes is the biggest one to be fair. So look out for that. Uh, um, and do support it. There'll be, uh, do give us five star on iTunes as well. Uh, so that helps encourage other people to watch it. That's if you look up the Owen Jones podcast, there's only a trailer there. Give it a five star review, just helps it going. And then tomorrow we'll do our big launch. Um, and I'm going to now thank the people who've sent in super chats. That includes the lovely, I can't say your name, Zaitoshi Beat, 
uh, enjoying this channel ever more since the change in format. Thank you so much. Thank you to Rajid D, who's a beloved regular. Thank you so much to uh, Leanne Powell. Thank you so much to Anthony Cope. And thank you so much to Jack Marshall. We really appreciate your support. It's absolutely fantastic. For those who are supporting us on Patreon, we really appreciate your support. We've got lots of documentaries to come and polemics and interviews, big interviews with lots of a, a range of people. We've got Peter O'Born uh, imminently coming up on his new book, but we uh, also have um, Professor Kahindi Andrews, who I interviewed today, who uh, talking about his new book on 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 how the empire has never gone away. Really interesting, fascinating uh, book. But we've got lots and lots of interviews, a range of people. So check out, look out for those. Subscribe, please subscribe. Just click the subscribe button. With the, obviously, we we getting. I mean, we're on one hundred fifty seven thousand people now, plus, which is fantastic. But the more people subscribe, the more the message goes out. Press the notification bell. But I really appreciate it. I, I hope you're excited about the podcast. So this will all be available wherever you are. Um, I hope you're doing well. It's a tough time. We'll get through this. I hope. Um, but as to finish off with, you know. We can't let them get away with this. The the worst death toll, one of the worst death tolls on the on the face of the earth, nearly the worst death toll, the worst death toll of any major country, uh, death rate of any major country. The economy in meltdown. This didn't need to happen. And however much a media which is so intertwined with the government and acts as its partisan defenders in so many ways tells us otherwise, this was not inevitable. And if we allow them to get away with this then a government can get away with anything. I will see you this Sunday at five o'clock for the next live show. Take care of yourselves. See you soon.